we have a guest in the studio so today we are going to have a double hour of uh, health friday the first one we're talking about alcohol and drug addiction rehabilitation we're joined by a consultant psychologist and human behaviorist wanjeri mahehu good morning good morning welcome to kenya's biggest conversation thank you it's good to have you here thank you you've watched it from far now here you are that's the hot seat of the situation yes. how does it and feel I listen to the music as well the ah. music especially the music, yeah? <laughs> it feels good i'm Karibisa. present very I'm good here. very good welcome yes. Wanjiro Ikonyo is our guest host. Say hello to her. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Wanjiro. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you too. Mm -hmm. I see somebody on social media saying that uh, I did not give the day's proverb for the there? first time ever. Hmm. That is not true. But anyway, if you missed it, here is the day's proverb. Wanjiro, let me give you the day's proverb. CT, our, our co-host, is away on holiday this week. Hmm. But he always has a proverb from one African country per week. And then he has several proverbs every day, a new proverb. This week he gave me the honor and told me, give them proverbs from West Africa. I bequeath you my powers. Imagine. <laughs> The responsibility is immense. Mm. Oh my goodness. You have borne it very well. <laughs> we are so proud of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say that again. Mostly proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the elder? Stop fishing. Okay. The, the, the proverbs from West Africa are from these three countries Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, around that region. Okay, the people are commonly called the Songhai. The proverb says, it is true that the camel will eventually die, but he will never stretch out and lay flat on his back. It is true that the camel will eventually die, but he will never stretch out and lay flat on his back. What's your interpretation of that? He doesn't give up. As in life, we will eventually die, but you know that sort of resignation, the giving up, we don't. Mm. Yeah. He'll always it's, be it's, upright. This is my first thought. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Good interpretation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Asante sana. Now, you are a consultant psychologist and a human behaviorist. Allah, mm. there's a difference. Mm. Uh, what's the difference? The difference is with psychology, we're talking about the self. Mm -hmm. Human behavior, we're talking about the self within a society within a culture. It's a continuation of both. So there's about me, the person, and then me in relation to you right. and the rest. Yeah, so that's basically... Me, the person, and me in... Community. In relation to. In relation to. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have had several conversations about, you know, addiction, alcohol and drug addiction. And it's a big thing. We even have a national authority for the campaign against alcohol and drug abuse in this country. We have had conversations. The deputy president is really now championing and talking about, listen, people, there is serious addiction in this country amongst our youth, and it's a big issue. From where you sit, is it that bad, Jerry? Yes. Explain. You know, they've been calling it an epidemic. I don't know if I call it an epidemic, but there's certainly a... Uh, addiction being the imprisonment or the a mind obsession, compulsive obsessive be be disorders, not just chemical, but even social like gambling, sex addictions, eating disorders, all of that. And it's, I think it needs attention, let's put it that way. It needs attention because even corruption, mm. that sort of behavior, you know, the, the compulsive dishonesty, mm. it needs attention. Because if it doesn't get attention, then it corrupts the social um, fiber. And if it does that, then you've got a people who can't think straight, um, who are um, drunk, Mm. alcoholically or otherwise mm. and therefore what they do and the thoughts that they think and the output of that thinking will be as a result of their corrupt thinking so then you get a society that is you know not not um not functioning not functioning a dysfunctional society a dysfunctional that's one. the word i'm looking for the people who've used those words that you've used you know it's an epidemic 
there's a crisis but how do we identify that crisis i mean just just people drinking and seeing people who are in social establishments mm -hmm. having a drink or mm -hmm. people who appear to be drunk what are these this signs that would make us say all right there's a problem let's stop everything and address this and address this okay there's a difference between abuse mm -hmm. and addiction there's a difference between abuse and addiction so there is like you could be like a a heavy drinker for example you're a heavy drinker what's the difference between a heavy drinker and an alcoholic because mm -hmm. there is a difference mm -hmm. so you'll find a society that you know this heavy drinking is a culture even europe is like that you know pinting and that sort of thing and it's a culture people drink they drink a lot they get drunk and the alcoholic mm -hmm. so the difference is there's the heavy drinking sort of culture and use of drugs smoking weed mm -hmm. um disco pills you know that sort of thing a culture and the addict mm -hmm. and um so what the addict has really no choice on whether to use or not it's become a morbidity a comorbidity as you know it's it's they've lost the choice if you tell them don't drink they cannot not drink mm. whereas the heavy drinker the cultural sort of person you tell them look you you're going to mess up your job you're messing up your liver there's a health crisis or you know you're a bad model to society and they will stop and think given a better option and be able to change without intervention external intervention mm -hmm. so so at one level we're dealing with a cultural thing where it's cool to drink it's cool to get high um, after work just go let's go pint that cultural thing mm. and on the other side we're dealing with a disease mm. okay so if we're looking at the burden in Kenya today, because there have been many things that have been said, mm -hmm. um, the rate at which many more people are consuming alcohol, um, not necessarily just to have a good time, but for it to almost be a crutch. Uh, it's getting to the point whereby you have to depend on it for something. How bad is it? I mean, you said bad. How bad is it now when now we're able to separate between the two, whereby folks are not just having a pint, as you say, to enjoy a Friday evening or getting to the weekend, but that now we're actually seeing more and more people become addicted and then it becomes a problem or a dysfunction. Mm. Um, what does that you, look like you mentioned, now? You mentioned something very interesting, the medicinal aspect, you know, because of the pain and the suffering and the grief and the whatever else is going on in, in somebody's life. And they will use alcohol or a drug to medicate that, to numb it. And that's across the board, you know, from the street child to the CEO. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, where somebody will be using to medicate a situation or to escape it mm. or to numb it, to numb the pain and the grief. Um, so that goes to say that in a way our society is not transitioning very well. When we think of our original culture where our governance was established you know we had the aunties the uncles the grandparents we had a social framework mm. you know and the child born into that was taken care of in each and every rika mm. you know <laughs> mm. each and Makes every sense. aspect of that yeah mm. of their life and so there was the safety of that culture there was ways of governing the psychosocial diseases mm. that would crop up mm. you know there was that was established so with the urbanization you know people come into this and even us our education um our religions mm. Mm. you know we're coming away from our inner culture that safety that security of who are we so what does that create it creates an inner void and that void is what causes this pain okay. and then when i am in pain I behave badly to you and then you're in pain and you behave badly. you know so this the dysfunction begins to happen and isolation mm -hmm. a depression uh, fear and anxiety um, guilt and shame you can you know a whole bunch of things 
which then now brings about the mental, mm. the mental we, illness. We've, we've heard it many times, but maybe you can just do. What does then alcohol do, or drugs do, in a situation whereby you may feel some kind of pain? What does the alcohol actually do uh, for you? It numbs it. Mm. It numbs it, um, and it, it it tells you all is well. Alcohol is actually a depressant but the effect that what we call the high the effect of intoxication it tells you it brings you to that happy place you know the place where i'm no longer shy i can speak i can do this i can speak to a girl i can you know mm. um boys gives you confidence you know you know you you shed all your social um inabilities and Inhibition. uh, inhibitions and all of that yeah so it gives you that it's momentary and that's why people pick up the next drink because when that starts to fade away then you top up um pills um you know depending on which one you pick Anything from energizing you, from sedating you, from helping you to sleep, from helping you to cut your appetite, helping you to be more pro productive, like more energetic, depending on what a person needs, or even just checking out, mm. you know, so as to evade your reality. Well, and Jerry, this is really powerful because obviously... Um, you know, the expectation is when we talk about alcohol abuse, we focus on alcohol, we focus on the drinker. But what you're saying is that there are social factors. There's this numbing factor. Um, and so if we want to deal with this problem, we have to understand those factors. Mm -hmm. um, so if you talk about change, change is inevitable. It's yes. going to happen. Yes. Um, you talk about religion that used to be a, a maybe kind of um, the norm. And now you're having especially a lot of young people not really relating with religion mm -hmm. and, you know, transitions there. This family structure also has changed. So is it inevitable then that we will have this pain and... We've then got also a political and economic environment that's Fantastic. very, very, very toxic, very harsh. Yeah. I was very pained. Um, there's this student, and I'll keep repeating because it really struck me, this mm. young lady who challenged um, the senator of um, Wasingisho. Wasingisho. Mm. And the question she asked, do you know... Um, an antidepressant. An antidepressant. Do you know the name? And you know, I could hear the pain. And she was saying so many young people are, are on antidepressants. And I was like, my God, this conversation is so much more than, than you know, it's so wide. So what's, what, what's happening? And how do we deal with this? Is this inevitable? What can we do? And are we doing the right things as parents, as communities, as government? Pain, uh, change is inevitable. How we manage the change, that's where I think we need to put our heads together to manage this change and also to realize that the change on our end of the world is much faster than what you would say like US or somewhere. Mm. Our cultural shifting is so much faster. So we need to put our heads together on how do we manage this change on all the different aspects. So you've got the mix of education. Mm. What is in that mix? What are we putting into the minds of our children? And how early do we start educating them on psychosocial issues should it be part of the curriculum you know life skills training mm. um psychology even you know um so that we equip them with the right tools in this life that they're going to that they're living um and because it's so much faster you'll find that your culture and your child's culture are different you know and that child's culture and their grandmother it's very so there's that isolation mm. that's what we have to manage 
Yes, there is. A, we're living in a toxic society, and and I'm not just blaming Kenya. It's around the world. Um, this age, it's a dark age, and there's a lot of murder and crime and abuse and all of that. It's a dark age, but being Kenya, maybe we can be smart. And we can acknowledge that and 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 ride over it. Kenya is a very religious country. There's a lot of prayer said in this nation every single day, but religion has to translate into spirit, so that we're feeding our souls. And when you look at a child like that who was just had to speak, I mean, she was between a, a rock and a hard place. She was like, "I am speaking," mm. you know. Well done, girl. But um, and why? It's the abuse. Yeah. Political abuse. Yeah. Do you know? And that shouldn't happen. That 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 is is not taking acceptable. us to the bottom. You say yeah. change is inevitable. Yes. But we in fact, it's welcomed. Wish, mm. but we should know how to manage the change. Yes. How can we, in our context as Kenya, how can we begin? to manage this change? We need a parliament of the souls where we have different thinkers. You know, the same way they do with political change, you know, mm. BBI and all that sort of thing. Mm. Social change, especially from a culture where we, we're Africans, we, society is important. If we had a parliament of the souls in just you know, in my imagination, mm. um, where you have these different thinkers. Yeah. There are so many effective tools that can be translated into action. Mm. You know, tools on thinking, critical thinking, tools on social behavior outside of religion. So it's not a religious conversation, mm. but it is a psychosocial conversation. Tools on self-management, self-regulation, because we lack that. You mm. find children growing up, they're brought up in school or by their auntie, and the parents have never really had an influence on that child's values and beliefs. Yeah. So self-management, they come into adolescence without any tools. They're just peer, peer followers, yeah. you know, without real identity of who am I and why am I here so tools on self-management tools on finance financial management you know that the, the normal um, the normal things mm. and coming to identity ide an identity mm. of who we are as a nation but also who we are as individuals mm. Um, because even though we're, we have this Africanism, which is Ubuntu type, mm -hmm. I see Ubuntu as like a, a necklace, a pearl, mm -hmm. a pearl necklace. So we all come together, but each pearl has a place and a say mm. inside of that necklace. necklace. Mm. So when we r rape a person's being, of their identity like when you're made to feel like you're a nothing yeah. for example that girl where you just stripped of your mm -hmm. yes. of your agency yeah mm -hmm. you know you you feel like you've just been stripped you're powerless mm -hmm. at the core mm -hmm. of your being mm -hmm. that powerlessness breeds a lot of mental illness mm -hmm. and also in some cases, crime. Some people will just get defiant. And they just move on. You know, as you're speaking this, I'm actually looking back and seeing our society has, in various occasions, tried to acknowledge what's happening to us. But it's like we shy away from addressing it fully. Look back into what happens to teenagers in schools and so many task forces established just can you just go to school because we're hearing that there's devil worship in schools and there's a report on devil worship in schools that comes and says oh yeah there are strange things that are happening in boarding schools we look at it and we shelve it even in our constitution making process when yashpal guy and team went around the country the issue of our social fabric and our moral fabric emerged but we didn't address it. 
BBI touched on moral fabric and values. It emerged, but we don't address it. The president established a task force on our mental health. They came back with a report and said, my friend, there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. Declare this a national disaster. We didn't address it. Yeah. When Mutudo was in parliament and he brought up the issue and said, look, there's a crisis in the country. Can we establish a framework that use, helps us to address it? And we formed NACADA. We created NACADA and then we pull back. It's like every time we try to look ourselves in the mirror, we see what we are seeing. We're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> we'll sort it out. Yeah, we turn away and we want to ignore that. How can we force ourselves? to actually look in the mirror and acknowledge that what we are seeing is not what we want to see. Well, reason being, okay, part of, part of that is the fear of our own reality. Mm -hmm. Looking in the mirror, it's hard for a lot of people, even in their own lives, to see yourself for what you are, look at your defects, look at your failures, look at your moral fiber or lack of it, and just address it. People don't have the courage to do that. And so when you look at these committees, yes, we can be academic about it. Mm -hmm. We can be Legal. professionals about mm -hmm. it and come up with these frameworks of this needs to be done. But why do we not step out and actually do it? We don't have the courage or we don't want to. We don't want to face it was the a tick in the box. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not important. And so what we are saying it is, is important we're losing ourselves and when you have people empowered with a broken spirit and a broken mind you get corruption mm -hmm. you get people who mm -hmm. you know what i mean you you've got a powerful madman mm -hmm. and so what's he going to do mm -hmm. with that power you can only imagine yeah. so if we can come back to a sanity a soundness of mind and acknowledge let's not be afraid let's face even in homes you see people who you know just to bring it down into the f a smaller scope mm. when people have marital differences or their child is acting up or their teenager is using drugs and and they don't want to look at it they don't want to accept it they come into therapy and they're skirting around the issue I'm just like, face it. Mm. The only way to deal with it is if you face it. And the only way to face it is to face it. Mm -hmm. That's the just, only way. Yeah. <laughs> and Kenyans, the we're only not, way to face we're it not good face at it. facing it. We, we tend to, we avoid strong, deep, interpersonal. Yes. And that is the dishonesty. Mm. Alcohol and drug abuse is a symptom. It is the symptom of an underlying issue. And that underlying issue is what you're saying we never get to because we deal with alcohol and drug abuse as the issue. Do you understand? Yeah. You can quit drinking as an alcoholic and never change, mm -hmm. but you don't drink anymore. We want the change. We want the transformation. We need to go deeper and deal with the, the issue. Now, if you look at alcohol and drug abuse and addiction as, as such it's a disease that tells you you don't have it the nature of it is there's the denial you know the denial mm. and denial is good in some way it's like you know when you're hit with grief you're told yeah. oh by the way your loved one has died the first thing you do is uh -uh. no you know because your brain needs that buffer to you know we don't just it, it could be just overwhelming to realize without the buffer Okay, so we have the denial, but we need to make, take the next right step. Now, this is where it gets political in, in many ways, because the next right step, you know, conferences, meetings, committees, da-da-da-da-da, tick in the box, travel, go for mm -hmm. conferences, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. And, you know, that there's a lot of hype in it, and there's a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of, even uh, government facilities have been offered for rehabilitation, but it has never reached, it has never done. Back to our social illness of, um, you know, where do the funds go? Or people mm -hmm. are just there to get, to get, mm -hmm. it's an office. Mm -hmm. It's an office, it's a job. It's a job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about, 
we're having conversations about what we want to see action. So maybe we need that um, the right people to take it into that step. The other thing you need to recognize is the people who bring in the drugs don't want you clean. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of resistance mm -hmm. to cleaning up your estate. Mm. They don't want you clean. They want to flood the streets with cheap cocaine and cheap crystal meth and whatever. So there's lots of money in that industry. They don't want you talking, let's get sober, let's get clean, let's clean up our system. So there's that resistance. And you don't know who these people are. Okay, then you look at Nakada, bless them. But why are they not in Ministry of Health or something like that? You know, okay, so maybe we can split it so that all the energy that's going into Nakara is going into healing the people. Um, because if it is under interior, then, okay, it can deal with the, with the dr drug barons and everything. That's what interior does, right? Mm. So deal with those drugs if I wish you luck, mm. because... It's a, it, that, that's the hard job. Mm. The healing can be done. People recover. They do. Mm. It can be done. So maybe split Nakada so that we get the healing empowered and financed with healers, doctors and nurses and therapists and counselors and social workers and recovered alcoholics who are, you know, trained mm. um, addictions counselors. And then we get the work done and that it is funded. What would that look and like? What would that look like? And I'm going to premise that on some of the examples that we've seen. I don't think two days go by before we see a story, whether it's covered in the paper whether it is a news bite that we see where something has happened as a result of clear um, um, mental health issue that could then yeah. be realized through the use of alcohol, it could be realized drugs, it could be realized that somebody has murdered somebody else. And it's clear that we see this, right? Yeah. What would it look like that you talk about this splitting Nakada, all right? What would happen? Would you have a resident? psychologist psychiatrist in every huduma center would you have Perhaps. in all public hospitals somebody who sat there and that was funded by government who would sit and say let me listen to your issues um would it be at every police the station national call center yes. would it be a, would there be a call center that i could call toll free 0800 and speak to somebody on the other end of the line yes. we start to embrace this culture of speaking because that's one of the major problems isn't it yes that we used to have a society whereby there were levels whereby you, you could share, yeah. whether it was your family, your whether granny, it was your, your co-wife, whether it was your uncles, whomever, whether it was the elders in the community. Mm. There was somebody you could take issues to. That has diminished over time. Yeah. So it's an isolationist kind of operation that we are all in today. Lucky are you who you have a friend to speak to, right? So that's where we see this action, this behavior of saying, well, let me rely on somebody else. And this somebody or something else then becomes the drink or whatever. That's who we rely on now. So we're saying essentially flip that and bring back in whatever capacity. Our village. Our village. Mm. 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 I so love saying, that. Bring back I our love village. That. village. Yeah. I love that. So Be we're saying, uh, um, now if you can't sit under the tree as it were, under the Udala tree as we say in my village, mm. put the person where they're accessible. Where you go to get your ID that frustrates you, there's somebody you can speak to. Where you go to get your medication, there's somebody you can speak to. Right. You have a phone, pick it up, and there's somebody at the other end of the line that you can speak to about issues. I had a conversation with somebody who works with one of the telecoms um, companies. And after midnight, the phone calls that they have is not, uh, I can't find my credits or I can't do what. It's, look, I want to talk to somebody. And they don't have an issue as such with their phone. Mm -hmm. They have an issue with it here. Mm. And here. Yes, and here. And here. Mm. So, isn't it and time here. then we got a little bit more deliberate about how we deal with this thing? And so, I hear AI you saying, let's mm. split this brick and mortar mm. and bring in the subjective, the software of this thing. And you know, it's interesting what, what you're saying. It's yeah. a, yes, it's being done. Mm. I remember how many years ago, some many years ago, and we were uh, the HIV campaign. Yeah. Yes. Ministry of Health mm. 
did that, they trained many counsellors. Every district hospital was manned. That's why I'm saying empower the Ministry of Health. They have manuals of how to counsel. They were ready to go round all the districts, all the district hospitals in the country so that when somebody calls in for help, you send them to their nearest counsellor because there will be somebody. It was, it was all set up that's been set up you mentioned stigma major issue if i am depressed mm -hmm. am i going to come and tell you i'm not feeling too well sure. no i'm going to tell you i have a flu i can't come or to work I'm today mm. i'm stressed yeah i'm stressed i'm stressed the stigma why because and, and i must say we've come such a long way you know from when we're in the 70s and being if you had <laughs> depression, you had to go to Mathar. It was, mm. it was, it was not like this. It was a this. straight ticket. Yes, and you got you a stamp, mad. a paper stamped, yeah, yeah, and unsuitable for employment. Mm. You know, so that was wow. you. You were done. We've come a very long way. So let's continue with this to destigmatize mental illness and addiction is a mental illness you know people say it's a disease, but really the disease is what it's a mental illness. Mm. So. We don't say that because, again, of the stigma. So we need to deal with the stigma so that we're having these conversations mm. without judgment. The same way your body gets ill is the same way your mind gets ill. And if your mind isn't well, that's it. You can break a leg and come to work. If you're not okay, you're done. Mm. I, I you love, know, I love what you're saying. I mean, I love what's coming out of here uh, because you're saying addiction is a mental illness and that the alcohol and drugs are a symptom yes. and that there are other symptoms we don't see. We don't see the sex addiction. We don't necessarily see the eating disorders. Of course, the family may see that. but And the codependencies. And the codependencies. Mm. And you're saying all of these are forms of addiction. And so much as there is Nakada dealing with drugs, the underlying issue is the addiction due to this disconnect and um, this isolation that needs to be dealt with. And what you're also saying is that we need a social solution because I think we've done the legal. Yes. Um, there's medical intervention as well. But the social is about that fabric, that support, the counseling, gone, yeah. bringing it into the lowest level, which again I like, bringing it to the village um, and I say from a governance point of view because I am a governance person when we talk about funding our health um, service at 7% as opposed to 15% these are some of the things that we miss yeah. and the thing is our priorities government priorities are in hardware Mm. We must build roads. We're talking about now electric um, vehicles. Mm. We are talking about, you know, you're moving from one thing to another, ignoring the software. So the interesting thing with what you're saying is that perhaps we governance advocates need to change how we talk about governance and talk about it from a social point of view. Yeah. And well. saying if you do not spend on the social, there'll be no people left to utilize these amazing buildings mm. and roads mm. and and you know that's uh, you know that's what really comes out for me and the question is how do we do that there was a um, are there countries that have been able yes to do that? yes um, and I may be politically wrong, but there's countries who've done this. It's called the Happiness Index. Mm -hmm. And it's being measured, you know, Dubai, Finland, New Zealand, all these. And you can Google it and you can see who's, who's top ranking on the Happiness Index mm -hmm. as a nation. It is being done. There are nations who are looking at why build our cities high with when man and build it goes. You know, you, you may have flashy everything and people who are just so disturbed and so unhappy and so spiritually poor. So you've got the poverty in their spirits and that they live in this flashy place. Mm -hmm. You know, but so why do you want to do that? Um, so that, that, there are nations who are doing that. They're building the framework of their people. Um, and what happens when you do that, you get more productive you find that the economic output is much higher. Mm. 
Because you come to work happy, you're, you're more productive, you're more peaceful, crime goes down because crime is also often born of disturbed minds. Mm. Um, so, there's peace. Isn't that what you want? Yeah. This is how to get it. Look after your people mm. from the inside. From the inside. Mm. So you're saying that even our crime management, and we said this when Shakahola, you know, took place, and we're saying um, the social setup had broken down because this happened in full view. Well, not in full view, but, you know, there's a community around that. And we've had other discussions here. And what we are saying is that our social fiber is eroding, broken, almost lost. And as a country and as a society, it means Kenya may actually be on a very downward trajectory. It is. Beyond the economics, because we don't have the foundation to sustain ourselves as a society. How do we get this message out there? Number one, this is what we're doing now. Mm. Thank you for this platform. Do you know, if media supports us, because there are many voices saying this, so it's being supported by media, getting the word out and out to the right ears um, is number one. It, awareness. Awareness. We are very religious people, and you would think with 85, is it 85 percent? Well, yeah. Religion. Yeah, Religion. something like that. Yes. Religion. Mm. Yeah. Why is our society broken? It means that it's not translating yep. spiritually, you know, because you mentioned the Khalifi thing, you know. And we have a mix, which people don't talk about, our spirituality can be negative or it can be positive. So we need to manage that. In the 60s, there was the moral rearmament movement here. Mm. The moral MRA, that was what MRA wanted to do, was to rearm morality. Mm -hmm. You know, rearm ourselves. Okay, they got banned and thrown out <laughs> um, because they were, you know, putting their heads into the political framework. Mm. <laughs> but the essence of MRA, that's what we need. You know, where, where it's not, not religious, mm. but it's just saying, look, you need to feel happy. You need to feel, have inner peace, which is the opposite of madness. Mm. You need to feel sp uh, not spiritually bankrupt, but fulfilled, yep. which is the opposite of addiction. Because one of the inner symptoms of addiction is the spiritual bankruptcy, mm. that sort of powerlessness, mm. just empty. You, mm. you hear people saying, I feel so empty, I feel so mm -hmm. that thing. Yeah. Um, so that you, you're... You tanked up nicely, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah, so from within, from within. And then on the other side, we need to watch what we're allowing through our borders. Mm -hmm. We can be that nation who says no to drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of money in Mira, there's a lot of money in mm -hmm. Malagoka. Yeah, um, okay, so guys, sit down and figure that out. What, what? The other thing that's never talked about is Flooding a nation with drugs is a way of suppressing that nation's, mm -hmm. and you'll, it's been documented, like in the Bronx, in New York, mm -hmm. and places like that, where people intentionally mm -hmm. flood your streets with drugs to corrupt your mind, so that you're. Mm -hmm. So could you that know? explain? If based on sorry to is could that explain what's happening in Kenya today? Because we do know that there's been an infiltration of experimental show drugs right now. Fentanyl. I mean, we're hearing that coming in more and more younger people, even the older folks, are now experimenting with things that were never in, were never at least in the numbers that we see in Kenya today. Does that explain some of that. Yeah, that's way beyond us because then you're talking about very high politics. Mm -hmm. um, but those in those positions should look into that mm -hmm. because. Social destruction is war. Mm -hmm. If I come and disrupt your social framework, I'm destroying you, Kenya. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's how. I don't have to come with a gun and shoot you and bring war. I can kill you by destroying your, your social framework, and that's very easy. That's one way to destroy a nation, mm. and that's what's done. 
I know, love what you're saying. Mm. There's also, you know, the need to talk about this. And, and you know, sorry, Eric. Mm. A lot of politicians have gone into the business of, of rehabs. Yes. So you have a sense where the people who are the policy makers who should be making the change are instead saying, oh, there's a market here. So how are they going to make policy to stop the, the problem when they are now beneficiaries of it? So, you know, I think that, <laughs> da yeah. True. One is there's the Degwa Commission, which is the political, that you shouldn't have people in policy making who are also in business mm. because there's a conflict. But then there's a need to deal with the thinking, with the political motivations mm -hmm. that continually put social issues aside. And so maybe our solution will come from elsewhere other than the political. From politics. Yes, yeah. And I Definitely. think that's what I'm hearing you say, Jerry, that, you know, mm. we've got to deal with the social fabric. Yes. Because there can be various approaches to the solution. One of them, of course, being policy level, programmatic level. But at that social level, at that very basic unit, who's this who is going to be the evangelist? Mm. So you've got the influencers in society. The influencers in a local community would be religious leaders, would be the elders, would be who are uh, the influencers. And how can we use those influencers to influence change and to impact change? Mm -hmm. Change is a movement. Mm -hmm. Management of change is a movement. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is why it's important to have social change not be political, mm -hmm. because we need to stay detached from from politics and all that other stuff. The intention needs to be clear. Mm -hmm. You mentioned rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. When rehabilitation becomes a business, you lose the you know the the intention of it which is the healing um and then we need to look at what is being offered in the rehabs because we're also having situations where our recovery rate is so low mm. um you know 40 percent maybe even less yeah um which is very low and why is that because of the programs what is being offered when you get into the into the rehab? Mm. Um, a good rehab will get the addict ready to. If they're not willing to get clean, a good rehab will get them to the to the place where they are willing. Because without the willingness, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But you can that treatment should get them to the place where they're like, okay, I get it, and and they surrender. Mm. Now, if it is a business, fill the beds, make the money, go. The come many back. times you come back, wonderful, mm. we make more money. No, not, not, I don't, I guess maybe they don't do it consciously mm. or maybe for lack of knowledge. But I think more needs to be done in terms of the programs being offered mm. inside of these rehabs. And we need more mental health, government mental health hospitals. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need them looked after. That are not damnation yeah. centers. <laughs> yes, yeah. we need them looked after. Mm. Some dignity. Mm -hmm. yes. We need dignity brought back into mel mental health treatment mm -hmm. because it's an illness just like any other. Mm. And it can be treated and people do recover mm. and function normally. It's doable. It's doable. All this is possible. Yes, mm. it's it is. Mm. It's imperative. Speak for 40 seconds to everybody who's watching you this morning? Oh, I'd like to speak to the addict. Mm. Um, addict who, 40 seconds, addict who's out there suffering, please do know recovery is possible. Reach out for help. There are helplines. Google, you'll find them. Nakada has one. Alcoholics Anonymous has one. The many free support groups. Don't give in to the disease. Don't. Don't. Surrender to your higher power and reach out for support. You can get well. Recovery is possible. Yes. Is full recovery possible? Yes. Like everything will be back. Yes. Your mental state, your brain, everything. In the sense that... Mm. <laughs> in the sense that... 
How can I liken it to, let's say, for example, it's, it's a notch in the brain you don't have, um, and that's addiction. And so full recovery will be you're totally functional. You can do anything and everything you ever wanted to be, but you won't grow another notch. Right. You still have that disability mm. in, in that space, mm. but you can function, and that's the goal, mm. is functionality, and you can function better than you ever did before. And with dignity. Very good. And with dignity. Mm. Thank you very much. Wanjeri Mahe, who is a consultant psychologist, a human behaviorist. She's been our guest this morning. Wonderful conversation. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.